Does the name John Schmitz mean anything to any of you? Well, it does to me. And maybe you can answer this question. What were you doing on November the 6th, 1972? I remember what I was doing. You see, I had turned 18 on November the 5th, 1972, on a Monday, and on Tuesday, for the first time in the history of the nation, 18-year-olds were allowed to vote for the president. And I got to vote by less than 24 hours. Maybe one of the youngest folks to ever have voted at that time. And I remember going to the, uh, went to the poll place in Millsburg where the school is, now where the middle school is, and I went in. I had never been in that school before because I didn't move here in time to go there. Well, no, not much. But when my brother went, he used to bring home pictures. So anyway, I go into the polling place, and I don't know if you remember who was running in 1972, but I do. And I looked at the one on one side, and I looked at the one on the other side, and to be honest with you, it was like holding up a stump trying to figure out which hand to kiss. <laughs> That's just how I felt about it. And, you know, I, you look at him this way, and you flip him around, and one hand's got teeth, and the other side just, well, you know what's on the other side. And neither one of them were very appealing to me. And I thought, I'm not going to vote for one of them. I'm just not going to do it. But I'm 18 years old, and I'm allowed to vote, and I'm going to vote. And so I voted for John Schmitz. Okay, I figured he was probably the biggest communist that ever, you know, just stood on two feet. I knew he had no chance to win, but I also knew that I was going to vote. And because I always have, always felt like it was, a, it was not just a privilege, it was a right and an obligation. I feel like that God gave me something that an awful lot of folks in the world can't even imagine, and that is the right to help choose leaders. <laughs> so I go in with all of my youthful exuberance. I look them over, and, and you may say, well, you sure wasted your vote. Well, let me explain to you what the other two guys accomplished. George McGovern, within 24 hours, had become the new leader in losing presidential election. He lost by the largest margin in history to Richard M. Nixon, who eventually got to be the guy that said, I'm the first guy you have to resign the presidency. So I don't know whatever happened to John Schmitz, but I am sort of proud that I voted for old Jay, you know, that's the first guy. That's, that's my story. I, I said, at least I didn't feel like I had to go out and wash in Clorox. <laughs> now, maybe you feel like, this, feel like this year, as things have gone through the process, that we're kind of back to the skunk, you know, like, okay. <laughs> maybe you do feel that way. I, I do. I can be honest with you. I'm not real proud of what I see out there. And I'm not throwing off on anybody. I'm just telling you. I'm just not real, real proud of the way they've conducted themselves and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's kind of funny because there are some folks out there, there's, there's one group on one side that sends me information and they say, you need to get out there and endorse somebody. And, and they want me to push the envelope because, you know, the IRS has this thing where they say if pastors do that, they will take away our tax exempt status and they're focused on that's an unconstitutional law and you need to get out there and push that envelope. And, and maybe... I do agree it's unconstitutional, but I also believe that I have the opportunity to stand here on the Lord's Day and up with one person, and I'm going to pick Jesus Christ over you. <laughs> now, that's why I don't endorse. I got another guy on one side, oh Barry Land. I don't know if you ever heard of Barry. He writes me, and he tells me that if I endorse somebody. He's going to come to the IRS, and they're going to give me a pink belly and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not afraid of Barry. I could care less what Barry thinks. I'm not afraid of him. That's not why I don't endorse. But I believe that my job is to uphold one. Now, I do want you to get, I want you to vote. I want you to um, pray about it. But here's what I want you to know. I watched a short video by Andy Stanley. 
don't know if you know who Andy Stanley is. He's a preacher down in Atlanta. His dad's a pastor. And Andy Stanley said, I want to talk to you folks, especially those of you that are 50 years old and older. Mm. And he said, you're scaring the children, knock it off. With all this stuff about gloom and doom of what's going to happen. And you know, I am, I'm very concerned that an awful lot of younger people are very disenfranchised and many don't even bother because they don't think it matters. And we need to let them know, yes it does. We need to remember something. That God is in control. Now, it matters who gets elected. Whoever we elect, they're going to be in charge of your health care. They're going to be in charge to some measure of the economy. They really can't make it better, but they sure know how to mess it up. They're going to be in charge of choosing support the Supreme Court nominees. They're going to be the commander-in-chief of the military, sitting in the, you know, the Oval Office tossing around the nuclear football. Now, it's probably an overstatement. But they will have the power to use nuclear capability. They will be in charge of education to some degree. They're going to be in charge of roads and infrastructure to some degree. And here's when it hits home. They're going to be in charge of your retirement and Social Security. Isn't that a comforting thought? It's not that it's not important, but I want you to look at me well at Psalm 146. In Psalm 146, the psalmist says, Verse 3, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man. I'm reading from the New King James in the, the little Bible I'm using here. You're reading the NIV, it reads slightly differently. <laughs> nor in the son of a man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, and in that very day his plans perish. There it is. There is humanity in a nutshell. You know, we have had some good presidents. We've had some bad presidents. They've come and gone. We've had some rascals, if you read into the history, all the way back. We've had folks that were not very good at all. But you know what? God still stands. Let's ask God to bless the word this morning. Father, I do pray that you would bless the word. Help us, God, to learn from you what you want us to know about who we trust I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, I don't want you to answer out loud, but how many of you have actually worried about this? And you think, man, I'm not encouraged at all. I mean, there are a lot of things going on. Our nation is in, I think, serious trouble for all kinds of reasons. Our economy. Some folks are doing okay. Some folks are not. What troubles me is when you look at the underpinnings of our economy, I don't see a lot of foundation there. Now, I'm not an economist, but I'm not stupid. I mean, you know, you can balance a checkbook. You know you're supposed to have this much money in before you write the check. That's why I say there are some real concerns about the economy. There are real concerns about our national security. There are real concerns about terrorism. There are real concerns about drafting our sons and daughters and sending them halfway around the world. These are big things, and it matters. But what I want to share with you today is, God says, do not trust in man. My question to you is, where in the Bible does it say that we are to look to Washington, D.C. for our well-being? We are not. I believe God establishes governments, and I believe that he is also the one who lifts one up and takes another one down. That's why I encourage the children, pray for whoever God puts in office or whoever gets in office. But God never tells us that we are to look to Washington, D.C. for our help. Nowhere does God encourage us to look to Wall Street as where our help comes from. You know, Wall Street, some of you have donated great amounts of money to Wall Street. And some of us, almost all of us, have, great, have donated great amounts to Washington, D.C. I'm going to tell you something. I have never felt when I gave money to the Lord that he blew it as badly as those two institutions do on a regular basis. And they get rewarded for messing things up. God rewards us 
we're simply trusting. And we need to think about that a little bit. People will let you down. In Proverbs 16, you still have your Bible open. In Proverbs 16, verse 25, it says, There is a way that appears to be right, but the end it leads to death. In other words, there are choices to be made, and those choices have consequences. In the spiritual realm, God tells us, listen, there are choices that I want to help you make. If you will listen to me, if you'll pay attention to me, I will cause you to prosper. And, and please understand, when I say prosper, I am not talking about these ministries where they promise you that if you give to them that you're going to drive a Cadillac or a Mercedes. I don't think God is intent, it really, I don't think God's desire is for you to be able to drive a nicer car or for you to be able to, uh, to afford a more expensive outfit or to live in a bigger house. I believe when God talks about blessing you, he's talking about giving you things you can't buy with money like inner peace like self-control, like self-respect, like the blessing of knowing that if you ask God to help you, he's not so far away or so out of touch or so unconcerned about you as a person. I believe God really cares about those things. And so here's the question. As I live my life, I can, be, I can trust in all kinds of things. And I can listen to various voices. There is a voice inside of each of us. It is called self. Now the term selfish is applied to a person who goes around listening to self all the time. Because your life will become about what you pay attention to. And so if you pay attention to the voice of self, you're always going to do what self wants. And you will not do what God wants. There are other voices. There are the voices of the world. We call that peer pressure, or we call it conforming. I want to tell you, somebody once uh, was asked, what is the key to success? His answer was, I don't know. But I know the key to failure is trying to please everybody. If you have major decisions to make, and you go around and you do a poll with all your friends, you're going to get a different answer from each and every one of them. And you know what? Maybe none of them are going to be right. In fact, they have no more chance of being right than you do in most cases especially on spiritual matters. And the spiritual matters are the ones that drive your life. It is those decisions that determine whether you have peace or whether you have anxiety. And we all have a measure of anxiety. But I'm talking about that anxiety that grips you and you can't let it down. The worry that won't go away, that keeps you up night after night, that brings fear and can sometimes actually bring, essentially, almost a paralysis. So we have the voice of self, and the problem with self is there is an inherent lack of knowledge. There is an inherent problem of understanding because we are limited. We're like a broken compass. And the same with your friends. Now there's another verse still, and that's the voice of the one the Bible calls a deceiver. The Bible says, that his native tongue is lying. He is all about fear. He is all about confusion. And he has very evil intent. And you know what? Every one of us have not only heard, but heeded that voice from time to time. It's that, you know, in the cartoon, it's the little devil that sits on his shoulder. But the truth matter, it's not a cartoon. And it's not really funny because he doesn't come to just be mischievous. He comes, the Bible says, to steal kill and destroy. He wants to steal and kill and destroy your relationship to God and eventually your life. In Proverbs chapter 3 verses 7 uh, I'm sorry, verses 5, 6 and 7 it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. When you want to know what to do, which way to go, which path to take, don't ask yourself, don't ask your friends, your neighbors, don't look to the world, 
God says, look to me. And if you will listen to him and submit to him, he says, I will make your path straight. He also says, he will light the path in front of you. And he says, I will go with you. And so the key to life is learning to trust God instead of those who control Social Security, those who control the military, those who think they control the economy. Are those things important? Sure they are. But they are not as important as God himself. You know what? Every one of you have been through a personal crisis to some degree. And some of you folks have been through personal crises that are much greater than anything I've ever known. And maybe I've been through some things that you would never understand. I will tell you this. My God has held my hand and led me through every one. You know what? There has there's never been a miracle except it was preceded by a catastrophe. You see, in the Bible it says that there was a man who had been blind from birth. How sad is that? But Jesus showed up. And that man was able to see. There was a man who couldn't stand up. He couldn't even get off his mat. He couldn't even get to where Jesus was. But he had four friends who lowered him down on a mat in front of Jesus. And Jesus Christ for <coughs> that man and then that made that man able to walk. A catastrophe turned into a miracle. There was a, a friend of theirs. Well, there was a lady who had been bleeding for years and had spent all of her money on health. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? <laughs> she touched the hem of his garment and he made her well. And one of their best friends had two sisters. And they called him and said, your friend and our brother Lazarus is about to die. And Jesus intentionally waited four days and he shows up three days after Lazarus had died. But when Jesus Christ came, he made it right. He made it better. He raised him from the dead. You understand that when God allows you to walk through a crisis, that in some way he is going to glorify himself and bless you in the midst of that crisis. I do not intend to say to you today that God will keep you from difficulties, or that God is going to say, I'll never let any bad thing happen. The truth of the matter is, bad things do happen because this is a broken world, but God has not left you in it alone. And he says, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. How am I supposed to do this? Well, it also says that I am to submit to him and hear my pastor. Now, a lady that used to come here, she's with the Lord now, her name is Christine Griffin. Some of you remember her. She never stopped where it says, and he will make your path straight. She always would intensely get my attention, and she'd say, do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and shun evil. Because she understood that that's part of it. You know why I have such a difficult time walking with the Lord? is because when he does speak to me and give me direction, I argue with him. He says, Alan, come this way. No, I want to go this way. Alan, this way. But Lord, and we argue. And sometimes I won't listen. And the reason is because I do not submit myself to him. I think there is something that is going to be better on this pathway than on the pathway he's telling me to take. And it really comes down to this. Who do I trust? Do I trust him or do I trust myself? And he keeps, he keeps urging me, Alan, this is the path. And I love it to two paths. And I'm questioning. Now here's, here's the problem. Only one of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, if you know what was going to happen tomorrow, you would be on Wall Street. You would be, you'd be buying stock every day. You would buy up a big old bunch of these stuff because tomorrow you already know what's going to happen. 
But you don't know that, do you? That's why you're here. God knows what tomorrow is going to bring. God knows the end of my decision. My problem is, I have this thing where I inherently think that there's something on this pathway that is of greater value than what God's calling me to. And either because of fear or because of something else, I'm just not willing to listen. And I do that over and over again. Now, the nice thing is, God doesn't get so mad at me. He says, look, I'm just sick of you. I'm not even going to talk to you anymore. There are times when I get mad at God, but God never gets to the point where he says, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. He's always saying to me, Alan, right where you are, pay attention. I will show you which way to go. Not only will he show you, he will light the path, and he will walk with you. He will defend you in that path. Are there going to be problems in that path? Yes, indeed. Every time you choose the path of God, guess what? Satan starts firing his little arrows from where he's at, trying to scare you off that pathway. And you know, sometimes he hits pretty close to home. But the question is, who am I really trusting? Am I trusting God that God knows best? And the truth of the matter is, I know that God knows best. God is omniscient. He knows everything. I try to make these plans, and God gets between me. You know, this past week, Carol and I, we've, we've been looking for a pickup. We sold our truck to Old Revan. That truck has been in our family longer than any of the grandchildren. I love them, but I, I miss my truck. <laughs> but now I'm going to be looking for a new one. And yesterday, I was this close. And I, mean, I was ready to buy tickets to fly to Atlanta to go pick this truck up and drive it home. I was ready to click the button. I've gone through all the information, ready to click. I thought, I better call. And there were two trunks now. I thought, surely one of them got sold just before I called. And the other one, they jacked the price up, $2,000. Now, there was a time in my life when somebody had done that, I would have given them an earful. I would have said, you sleazy. <laughs> And, and now it's not that I don't have the capability of doing that. But you know what? I prayed about this first. I said, God, if it's not what you want me to have, take it away. Guess what? You've got to take it away. <laughs> now what do you do? Do you get mad and act like an idiot and cut somebody out because of me? No. You say, God, you are in control. If you're not going to listen to him, why do you ask? Don't you imagine he asks you that sometimes? It's not rocket science here. You know, I will say this, and he's out of the race now. But Dr. Ben Carson had such intellect and such a temperament, and his story, if you've never read his story, a man of God. And I, I thought, man, I'd love to see somebody like that. And he's out of it now. But you know what? And, and, but here's the thing. It's not about how smart you are. It's about whether or not you trust God to listen. And when God says, this is the way, are you willing to say, okay, Father, you know better than me. The Bible says that we are to fear God. That's a big secret. Now, what does that mean? It means that I fear saying no to God more than the consequences of saying yes. Will saying yes to God cost me? Yes. It's going to cost me something. In fact, the Bible says we're supposed to count that cost. We are to acknowledge that cost because when we follow Christ, eventually he's going to say, I want you to lay down everything. And I want you to follow me. That's what he means when he says take up your cross. He says, I want you to lay down everything. And he's very patient with us. If he lets us lay stuff down, sometimes we've got a handful behind our back. We're still walking. But we got a handful behind our back like he don't know it. And sometimes we've got a string and we're pulling it behind us. And the and Lord's saying, you're not keeping up very well. Well, I'm doing the best I can. You know, don't want to say that loud, but I'm dragging this behind me. He knows. 
<laughs> but it's not until I finally get to that place where I say, oh, Lord, you, yourself, are enough. And I have to trust you to take care of me all the way, or I don't. It's not easy, but it's not rocket science. What do I fear? Do I fear the cost of following Jesus, or do I really fear the cost of not following him? And you know what? That's not rocket science. You know the answer to that. The cost of not following him is everything with no home. And if it costs me everything to follow him, at very worst, I get heaven. Forever. And I get him. Forever. <clears throat> then it says that I need to know his word because that's how I learn to follow him. You see, the Bible is God's Word. It is the Holy Spirit who put it in the writers of the Scriptures to write what He wanted us to know. And so, I learned to train my brain by reading the Scriptures. I found out something really interesting this week. And I forgot exactly where I read it. I may have read it in the old magazine. And it said that our brains have these has this capability when you make a decision your brain starts creating a pathway and every time you make that decision when that decision becomes habitual the reason habits are so difficult to break is because your brain electronically creates pathways of flow that's why habits are so hard to break we make a decision that decision your brain it's like a computer remembers something you did, and the next time you go on, it automatically starts you in that direction. And our brains have these channels, and it becomes much easier to follow that channel than it is to go back and undo it. It's like spell check. And eventually, you realize that's how the Grand Canyon was made. And so for the Colorado River to get out of the Grand Canyon now would be rather difficult. But the truth of the matter is, God will come and give us grace, even when we have created habitual patterns of behavior, of unbelief. God will come and make new patterns for us. You know, we are not victims of our brains. We are not controlled to, by our brain to the extent where we cannot make decisions and real free choices. We can. We just create patterns and habits. But God can come and bring healing, just like he did to the blind, just like he did to the lame, just like he did to the woman with the issue of blood. He can even raise the man. And so, I am to train my brain. I put it this way. You take the Bible. The Bible talks about the washing of the Word. Here's a, here's a daily plan for you. Wash, rinse, repeat. With this. The Bible. That's why I encourage you to read it. That's why we put this up on the wall and I encourage you to memorize it. You put it in here. And this is what God uses. Because he says, my sheep know my voice. And we start listening and we realize, yes, I recognize that. That's the voice of truth. Have you ever noticed that the truth rings true? And you realize that is truth. The lie always sounds like a lie. There are times when... The deceiver disguises his voice. But then Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and they will never follow a stranger. It is by making better choices that I change habits, because God is filled with grace to help me. And then to do what it says. So I'm listening to the voice. I wash my mind with the word of God, and now it's a matter of make the choice. Choose to be obedient and submitted to God's Word. Have you ever read the book, In His Steps? Have any of you ever read that book? It's a tremendous book. It's a novel. It's, one, it's an old novel. It's probably one of the three most read books in history. And it's a story of a man who was in church. Actually, he was a pastor. And he was challenged by this thought. What would happen if for one year with every decision no matter how big or how small what would happen if I prayed before I made the decision and then did what I really believe God 
would have you to do on everything. Now think about that for a minute. Prayed about everything, and before he made a move, he asked God, show me what to do, and then he said, I will do whatever God wants me to do. What would it cost? It's a tremendous book. If you've not read that, may I encourage you to get it. It's called In His Steps. We got some copies around here. You can get it on, you know, all those sites you belong to. It's worth it. It's an easy read. It's just a couple of bucks. But I'm going to tell you what. It will really open your eyes to what can happen. I really believe this. I believe that people are hungry to see the power of God again. I think folks are disenfranchised with so many churches and church members because they don't see the power of God in our lives. And they don't want to give up on God, but they aren't seeing the power of God alive in people's lives. And you know why? Because too many of us have learned to say no and be content with God. Because the power of God lives in those that he can trust with that power. The lastly, it is to be obedient and to trust God so that my obedience and godliness on my part is met by his grace and his love and his blessing. God delights in giving us good things. So those of us that have been parents, we know what it's like to have to discipline your children. It is not fun. But there is nothing quite so fulfilling as seeing your family functioning, loving, working together, eating together, laughing together, playing together, working together. That's one of the greatest things in life. God earnestly desires to have that kind of working relationship with his church, each and every one of you. God has the power to do anything we ask of him. The question is, are we ready to follow the pathway that he sets forth that says, this is where that blessing lives. This is where life is. This is where joy lives. This is where peace lives. This is where contentment lives. And I can have those things. Jesus spoke not just about the reward of heaven after I die. He talked about an abundant life here. Not worry-free, not trouble-free but filled with him. Mm -hmm. Every crisis that God leads us through on that pathway is so that we may look more like him at the end of that pathway. Who are you trusting in? Yep, Washington's broken. Wall Street's broken. Our culture is still on shaky ground. There are a lot of folks still living paycheck to paycheck and some not getting a paycheck. There is uncertainty, there is inhumanity. This area, like most areas now, is filled with crime and drugs. But Jesus Christ is still king. He's still on the throne. He's still sovereign. He holds tomorrow in the palm of his hand. He's still almighty. He is still wise and omniscient. He still sees everything and he still cares. And he still can and will keep his promises to you. He knows exactly what to do. He knows what to do before you realize that you've got a problem. When you realize you're in trouble and you drop to your knees and you cry out to God before you ever knew you had a problem, he already knew what to do about it. And the question is, am I ready to say, God, if you will like that path, and if you will show me the way, I'm willing to walk in it, no matter what. He knows what to do. And he knows when the time for everything comes. And so regardless of what happens in the world around me and you, God is perfectly capable.